I could feel his arm moving. And I, it looked like he was punching me. Did you notice any marks on her face when you were speaking with her? No. She screamed at me once in person, multiple times screaming at me over the phone. I did not deck you. I was hitting you. I said, you think it's so funny? You think it's funny, bitch? You said, I will her burnt corpse afterwards to make sure she is dead. Did I read that right? You certainly did. The Depp defamation trial has already given us so many moments that will live on in the public's mind. But what are the top 20 moments so far? Over the next two hours, we will be looking back at moments 20 through 11, compelling testimony and courtroom interactions that the jury will be wrestling with. One thing we should all remember, this is a tragic story with allegations of domestic violence and rampant drug abuse. But who will the jury believe? That's coming up next. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. We are just a few days away from the testimony resuming in the showdown between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Court is nearing the end of a week-long pause. Heard faces cross-examination when court does re re reconvene rather in Fairfax, Virginia on Monday. This is a case in which actor Johnny Depp is suing his ex-wife for $50 million following an op-ed that she wrote about domestic violence. Heard is counter-suing Depp for $100 million. When testimony resumes, the judge will be watching the clock. Why? Because she has allotted 61 hours and 15 minutes to each side to present their case. Here's where both sides stand. Johnny has about 26 hours left to make his case, including any cross-examination. Amber has even less time, just under 25 hours. And now, let's jump into the list. The number 20 moment in the Depp defamation trial is the emotional testimony of Johnny Depp's sister. Christy Dombrowski was the first witness called and she really set the table for the plaintiff, testifying about how Depp suffered abuse at the hands of his own mother. Our parents were, they had two um, completely different personalities and where our father was a, also a very kind, patient, loving, gentle uh, man and our mom was the opposite she was very high strung very nervous uh, anxiety angry so they they were completely opposite people did your mother betty ever get angry with your father yes how would your mother express her anger toward your father mom would she would scream, she would yell at him, um, she would hit him, call him names, that kind of thing. Did your father ever hit your mother back? No, dad, dad never reacted um, when mom would hit him or scream at him. If he didn't hit her back, how, if at all, did he react? Basically, um, he would let her scream and get it out or hit and, and, and be done. And the, the, the way that you dealt with my mom, the way that he dealt with my mom was he always tried to keep the peace. So he never wanted to, you know, he, he didn't want to engage in anything. So he was very, you know, uh, sort of, he would step back. And whatever it was that she was angry about, he would try to go ahead and make sure that he took care of whatever she was insisting that he do. Is it fair to say he did what she wanted? Yes, it's very fair to say he did. What, if anything, did you and Johnny do while your mother was hitting or attacking your father? We would, we would leave the area. We would run and hide. We would go to our, our room, uh, you know, either we would go to our room together or, you know, depending on where we lived, you know, our, if our room was close, um, we would sort of run off and get away from it. How did your mother treat you and your brothers and sisters? 
Well, there's a, there's a similarity, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, in how she treated dad. Um, again, she was a very anxious, high strung. Uh, she screamed, she yelled, she hit, uh, she threw things. She called us names. You know, we each had our own little special uh, set of names. Some we wouldn't repeat, but um, so she gave each one of us a name. My, my name, for example, was uh, Violet, uh, which to some people, it, it wouldn't seem like it's anything, but Violet was my father's mother and my mom hated my father's mother. So that was my special name, one of them. Did your mother have any special names for Johnny? <laughs> yes, she did. Um, she had a few, again, some to not repeat. Um, her favorite, I think, was she called him One Eye. Um, and she called him that because uh, when he was young, the, the doctors thought he had a lazy eye, so they, they would put a patch on his good eye so that they would strengthen the other eye. So she used that as, you know, a way to find a, a new fun name for him. How did Johnny respond when your mother would call him One Eye? Well, he didn't respond in any negative way. Those names were, they were just a way of life. We, we got used to them. We accepted all of it. Putting aside the names, did your mother ever get angry with you? Yes. Did your mother ever get physical with you? Yes, she did, but I was um, also very quiet, very shy, and I, I learned early on to stay back. Um, so I was, I was more in the background because I would constantly sort of stay in the background to stay away from trouble. Ms. Dombrowski, when she, your mother did get physical with you, what forms did that take? Well, she would, she would hit us. Um, she would throw things. Uh, she would have us go pick a switch, you know, off of a tree, you know, so that that would be what she could hit us with and make sure that we got one that was nice and green. So why, it, why, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Why did it have to be nice and green? Well, um, if it wasn't a nice green switch, twig, it would, it would snap. Those didn't break. If you got a dry one, they snap. They don't, they don't work the same. How, if at all, did Johnny react when his mother would hit him? He was a typical little boy where if it hurt, he would cry. Um, that was it. I mean, for the most part, you just wanted to get away from it. Did Johnny ever hit his mother back? No. What about when he got to be an older boy? Did he ever resist or hit her no. back? No, no, when he, when he was older, even if she hit or threw things, he, he never went to that place. He always, he would get away. He would, you know, leave the area, go to his room. Ms. Dombrowski, did there come a time when you left the family household? Yes. When did you leave? the household? Um, I left when I was 17. Um, I was pregnant and got married and moved out into my own place. How did it feel when you left the family to go out and go to your own place? I think uh, there's a bittersweetness to it. Um, I, I was really young. I had just turned 17. Um, but I was so looking forward to this new life that I could create that was different from what we had at home. And um, so it was a part of me that was really happy to, to be able to do this, really excited. And there was another part that was sad because I left behind my little brother and my dad. I would like to welcome my guest for this hour, family law and trial attorney, Jenny Brown. Jenny, let's talk about trial strategy first. This is moment number 20, but this was the very first witness that was put up by the, uh, by the um, plaintiff, by Johnny Depp on the stand. 
She didn't have a lot of energy, but she had a lot of details about abuse suffered by the hands of their mother. Yes, Ashley, thank you so much for having me again. I think the most important thing about this witness is she comes off is so believable. Her story seems so natural that she's just recalling her childhood like she would be having the conversation to anyone. And it mirrors very closely what Johnny Depp comes and testifies to next. So she's providing credibility to his story and really laying this foundation of, look, our one of our uh, key you know, points of this case is he retreats. He's not the aggressor. And she's saying he learned that from childhood and it mirrors very closely his testimony. That's right. That's one of the other talking points I wanted to bring up because as you're listening to her testify, you do think not only is she describing all the horrific abuse that they suffered at the hands of the mother, but also to your point that Johnny Depp did not hit back, that he was always wanting to keep the peace. And so that's another part of it because I think that clearly Clearly, the goal is for the jury to believe that no matter how much someone is doing things to him, he's going to be a peacemaker and he's not going to respond with hitting. Yes, I completely agree. And it's showing that, you know, this isn't the first time that he's been in this situation. And he talks about that. He talks about the fact that he realized that he was in a relationship with his mother and something that he didn't expect. But this isn't the first time in his life that this has came up. And I thought she was really believable. Uh, yes, I think that she was very credible as you listened to her testify, the very first witness that Johnny Depp called right out of the shoots. All right, Jenny, you're going to stay with us. Coming up, we're going to continue with our countdown. Crowds outside the courthouse have become a very important part of this trial with Amber Heard hearing abuse from Depp fans. We will talk about how these supporters are affecting this case and what's up with the alpacas. More on that after the break. Go to prettylitter.com. I'm starting to think we're related. Thank you so much. Back to our countdown of the top 20 moments in the de defamation trial so far. The happenings outside of the courthouse have become a huge point of interest. Crowds are growing with each day of testimony, booing on Amber Heard and cheering on Johnny Depp. Access to the courtroom gallery has been a hot commodity with fans camping out overnight to get those wanted wristbands. One woman brought two alpacas, emotional support animals to help brighten Depp's day. Now, earlier, Depp had said he wouldn't make another Pirates of the Caribbean movie if Disney offered him $300 million and a million alpacas. Court TV's Chanley Painter has more on one devout group of Johnny Depp supporters as they camped out overnight on their quest for a wristband. I definitely support Johnny 110%. There's not a doubt in my mind. Dedicated Johnny Depp fans camp outside the Fairfax, Virginia courthouse in the late night hours of Tuesday, May 3rd. They're hoping for a wristband that will get them into the courtroom to see the stars in person. It's the day after Johnny Depp's team rested its case as the plaintiff in the high stakes defamation trial against his ex-wife Amber Heard. At approximately 9.45 p.m., the first two in line are Yvonne and her best friend, Debbie, Johnny Depp super fans. They're bundled up for a long night of waiting. She's my cohort in crime. Yeah. So we go to all the concerts, we go to premieres, premieres any events, anything with Johnny. And we've been here for two weeks, for the first two weeks of the trial, just for Johnny. I'm from L.A., Debbie I'm is from, from Houston, Houston, and we've been fans forever. I've been his biggest fan for 36 years. At 10 p.m., one fan is seen walking their dog to pass the time. At 10.30 p.m., the wind picks up at the courthouse, but that doesn't stop these two fans who drove in from Virginia. There's our other regulars right there. They just got here. At 11 p.m., two men arrive unloading sleeping gear from their car. They are ready for the camping hours ahead. It's early. Yes, it's really we can't just watch this on TV. <laughs> it's not the same experience. 
At 11.30 p.m., a woman from South Carolina arrives with a sleeping bag, pillow, and blanket. Just before midnight at 11.45 p.m., the rain moves in and more fans come pouring in. Uh, what time do we come? 12.50. 12.50. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> the rain didn't stop you. No. did not stop After a few hours pass, more fans settle in. At 2.30 a.m. the next day, the line has extended as far back as the front entrance of the courthouse. Some of them started showing up around 11, a few, 12, and then one. I lost track after they got out of my range. At 3 a.m., the rain continues to steadily come down. New arrivals show up one by one and sometimes in groups, all for a chance at getting one of the coveted wristbands. I've never seen it this time this far back. Have you? No. At 5.30 a.m., over 90 people are in line. The early campers began cleaning up, taking their sleeping gear, chairs, and food back to their cars. A number of them even change out their clothes in their cars. At 6.45 a.m., as the sun is beginning to rise, more energy fills the area as people now stand up in line and prepare for deputies to arrive. At 7 a.m., Fairfax County Sheriff's deputies set up a table to distribute the 100 wristbands reserved for the courtroom where Depp and Heard are squaring off. Johnny Depp superfans Yvonne and Debbie are the first up. What does she write on there? Just the number one. About number one. one. At 7.45 a.m., the last of the 100 wristbands are given away for seats in the courtroom. All asking for courtroom 5J have been given out this time. We're now giving out over Another 50 wristbands will let people into an overflow courtroom where people watch the trial on monitors. This is my first time trying to get in. Oh, wow. I didn't know if I was way too late or not. Nearly two hours later, with 100 fans packed in the courthouse, a black SUV pulls into a closely guarded parking lot. It's now 9.30 a.m. And Johnny Depp has arrived for another day in court. Still with us, trial attorney Jenny Brown. Jenny, let me just say, when I was on the bench, my producer just made a good point. I never had a crowd waiting for wristbands to come and watch the trial in my courtroom. This is really crazy. It really is more of um, like looking for extras for a movie than it is a courtroom environment. Is this surprising to you? I mean, talk about dedication. People are arriving at nine o'clock the night before and are willing to sit all through the night, rain, cold, to see this trial. And obviously a huge part of this is the celebrity status. But I think another big issue or a big um, attraction here is the relatability. This trial has everything. It has false allegations. It has toxic relationships. It's got, you know, abuse as a child and how that runs into your relationships as an adult. So I think it's really relatable to many people. And I think that this is a lot of why Johnny Depp brought the trial in the first place is to tell his story, whether he recovers any money or not, but to tell it from his side. And a lot of viewers are saying on social media that he's done that effectively enough to really have rehabilitated his career. But speaking of social media, they've been intimately involved in this trial. I want to take a look at a social comment from our Court TV Facebook page about all of the fanfare. Nicole says Depp's fans didn't come running to his defensive. We have been there supporting him the whole time. The industry has shown it doesn't care about the fanfare. They care about the marketability. And I think that's part of that cancel, cancel culture. But I think it's always true, right? It's, it's about the marketability when you have someone that is someone who uh, can, can make this much money, quite frankly, for all the movie makers. 
Sure. And you know, the the Me Too movement has made such progress for domestic violence victims. But there's also been a other side to that where there has been people empowered to make false allegations. And we have certainly seen that in divorce cases where people make false allegations and it's very, very hard to um, provide a defense. It's very often he said, she said. And so we're hearing a lot of recordings here, but the op-ed that came out very much made it seem like Amber Heard was just a victim. And the trial is showing us something very different. It was a very toxic relationship with two people that did not need to be together. And one of our comments from social media is echoing exactly what you're saying. Sarah Alvarado says, I was never a fan of Johnny Depp. I'm not a fan of pirates. I am a fan of truth and justice, as are millions of people as we watch this very obvious case. It's not merely his fans that are coming to his defense. It's scores and scores of real domestic violence victims who are deeply offended by the conduct of Amber Heard. And to your point, Jenny, whatever this jury finds, we've got that issue, whether or not they've made up allegations, they being Amber Heard, or whether or not they, they choose to believe Amber Heard and think that Johnny Depp did it. Either way, it becomes that issue of domestic violence. All right, you're gonna stay with us. We're gonna continue breaking down some of the most talked about moments in the Depp versus Heard civil trial, including the interesting testimony of the front desk employee at one of Depp's homes from his car. But up next, Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae joins us to discuss the latest in the Alabama inmate who escaped and the officer that helped with his breakout. Online to easyknock.com now. I felt like the luckiest woman in the world. I know you have red lipstick. Oh, that's all right. We'll be all right. <laughs> I didn't know if the bottle that he had inside me was broken. Amber Heard's testimony on the stand, and what, did, what do you think about? She's a liar. She's absolutely a liar. She's, she's not, she's not real. I don't know. I don't know. Amber, shut up. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Of course, it's my honor to be with you this afternoon. Throughout the Depp Heard trial, there have been some pretty unforgettable moments, and we will get back into our top 20 countdown in just a moment. But first, we want to update another big story we're following here on Court TV. Court TV has learned new details about the case of the recaptured Alabama inmate and the corrections officer who helped his escape. Casey White and the late Vicki White. We now have some of Vicki White's 911 call just moments before she died. Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae here on set with more. Always great to see you, to have you. Tell us what's the latest in this story. Great to be with you, Ashley. It's a story that has been unbelievable as far as the circumstances surrounding this jailbreak and then the dramatic apprehension that happened, which did put Casey White behind bars again. Again, Vicki White died there at that apprehension. And we have that video of the apprehension, the dash cam video that showed these officers arriving to the scene. You can even see her body being pulled out and then Casey also being pulled out of that vehicle. And we know that she died and it seemed to be apparently that she shot herself with a firearm. But that has been confirmed now by the coroner's office that this was a self-inflicted wound. But we're hearing some of her last moments from a 911 call that it seems was placed in the moments before this happened. Let's take a listen. Oh my God. Let's get out. Run. Get the 
It's really brief. It's really even hard to know what to make of it. You hear her there. The transcription lets us know she's saying something about a hotel. Is she talking to Casey White saying we want to make a run for it and go to the hotel? But then there's this scream, and it's presumed that after that scream is when she fires her weapon. And when those officers pulled her out of that vehicle, that weapon was still in her hand. They had to remove it first before getting her out of the car. Well, just uh, this case, I mean, it's amazing the details as we continue to learn them, Julia. And I think there were so many guns recovered that I think we're just um, relieved, quite frankly, that more people weren't injured or killed than all the officers. So knowing that, what's next for Casey White now that he's been rearrested? I think that's a very important point that you just made because they were on the run with all of those guns inside the vehicle. He is behind bars. We have the new mugshot that they've taken of him where it, actually there he is being taken into custody and put in a car after that. But just look at how tall this man is. He is 6'9". It's really been a question of how she was able to take him out of her facility unnoticed by other people. I mean, these other officers around him, they're barely coming up to his shoulder just the sheer stature of this man. We also even have the video of when he was apprehended by those officers actually at the scene. Uh, he is behind bars, of course, already serving that 75-year sentence, but could there be more charges from this is what we have yet to see. All right, I know you're going to continue to keep us updated. Thank you so much for being here with us and updating us on this case. We're now going to continue to break down some of the highlights from the civil trial of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Our number 18 moment happened during Amber Heard's testimony from last week. While testifying about suffering abuse at the hands of Johnny Depp, she mentioned one of Depp's former girlfriends, Kate Moss. Heard referenced a rumor that Depp pushed Moss down the stairs when they were dating back in the 90s, which now allows Depp's team to call Moss to the stand to impeach Heard's testimony. That's a really big deal. Let's listen to that moment in court. But I was screaming at him because he threw this can at me and everything else that had happened. And when I did that, he bolted up the stairs. <laughs> and, you know, there was only, I mean, he, he, was up, he was up the first flight of stairs. Again, I'm on the mezzanine, which is in between two flights of stairs. He bolted up the steps. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I don't know how he managed to get his hands in my hair so fast, but he had his um, hand on the back of my, my head, my hair and kind of was yanking me down and um, hit me in the face with this cast he had. Um, I just remember this, this brief struggle we had before we kind of break away Whitney, my sister, um, all of a sudden put herself in between Johnny and I uh, she just threw herself, like, in the line of fire or whatever. She just all of a sudden was there and was trying to get Johnny to stop. Um, her back was to the staircase. And Johnny swings at her. And I just see my little sister with her back on, face, her back to the staircase. And Johnny swings at her, and I don't even wait, don't even wait for any other, I don't hesitate, I don't wait, I just in my head instantly think of Kate Moss and the stairs and I swung at him. And all of my relationship to date with Johnny, I hadn't landed a blow. And I, for the first time, hit him, like actually hit him. Square in the face. Now keep in mind, Moss has never publicly accused Depp of abuse, and in interviews, she has spoken kindly about him. Let's take a look at the moment one more time with the focus on Depp's team at the mention of Moss's name. Take a look. I don't hesitate, I don't wait, I just in my head instantly think of Kate Moss and the stairs, and I swung at him. And all of my relationship to date with Johnny, 
I hadn't landed a blow. Attorney Jenny Brown still with us. Jenny, on direct examination, if you want to open that door and I'm going to cross, I'm coming in, I'm going to ask those questions. Do you think Hurd's team thought, oh no, we didn't want you to go there? I definitely think that's what happened. I think the court by this time has already made it very clear what what they're going to allow into evidence and what they're not. But those rules change when someone opens the door. And that's exactly what she did there. These are the moments in trial that attorneys wait for and hope that there is a slip on the stand. And that's exactly what happened here. And you could tell by the reaction they were not expecting it. So I can't wait to see the rebuttal case by Johnny Depp. Now we want to move ahead, though, to our, to our next moment at number 17, the testimony of front desk employee at the Eastern Columbia building, Alejandro Romero. The witness captured the heart of the Internet, giving his testimony from his car and actually vaping during his video deposition. The moment that even took the judge by surprise was when he began driving during the end of his testimony. Did her treat you well and was she friendly to you in each of these hundreds of times? Yes, yes. I, I'm not going to say no because she was really always nice. All right, this I is my last question. Be nice. All right, this is my last question. You testified in response to Mr. Presidio's questions. Um, that you testified truthfully in all of these occasions. Did you testify truthfully, truthfully to everything that you testified in response to my questions today? That's correct. Uh, all right. I, I did. All right. I, that was a first. I'm sorry. I, I, will, I will say, Your Honor, that is the most bizarre episode. Okay. All right. I was going to say, I've just never seen that before. I've seen a lot of things, but I've just never seen that. You started driving that. Yeah, that did it. Please don't do that at home if you're testifying or under oath. Romero did testify, though, in spite of that, to very important matters for Team Depp. He said he never saw Johnny Depp be violent or abusive and never saw any bruises or cuts on Hurd's face when he saw her only four days after the final alleged physical dispute of Hurd and Depp. They asked me if I remember seeing anything. I said, I just don't recall seeing any marks and bruises because she was just sitting in front of me. I just don't remember any, seeing anything. Just don't remember. If it, how it would have been so obvious, like someone had like a black eye, I would have like, whoa, you know, I would have seen that. And I would have remembered. She was like three feet away from me. She was right in front of me. I just don't remember seeing any marks bruises or anything. But you don't know whether she was wearing makeup to cover it, do you? No, I don't know. I, I, she was wearing any makeup to cover it, probably. You know, the, the probably would you would probably would cover any bruise, but you cannot cover the swelling. Were you looking for swelling? No, I can say I was not looking for anything. I always make eye contact with someone I'm talking to, but I'm not looking to find something like, like, oh, your makeup is wrong, uh, you, you haven't uh, have changed your eyebrows, or your uh, eyelashes are not even, or I'm not looking for anything. I'm just looking at their eyes, and I'm, looking, I'm not looking for anything else. But if I see something, I will re probably will remember. If you saw something, right? Yeah, I, I would have probably would see, like, if she had a swollen, like, if she was wearing makeup, probably would have been seeing the swollen. I probably would remember that. But I was not looking for anything. I was like, oh, you know. How, how swollen was Amber on the 25th of May? How swollen was her cheek? Well, then? According to the pictures you, you, I've been seeing right now that you're showing me, it was pretty swollen. I would probably would remember that. Jenny, what compelling testimony. An eyewitness saw her four days later and uh, repeatedly said, I didn't notice it. I didn't see anything. If it was that swollen, I think I would have seen it. How credible did you find him? I mean, he comes off as a genuinely nice guy. He also seems like, look, this we are beating a dead horse here. I've talked about this so many times. But he says, if I noticed something, I would say I noticed something. I didn't see anything. Could she have covered it up? 
Sure, that's possible. But if it was swollen, I would have noticed that. This is someone who knows her, who sees her frequently, who says, look, she was she was kind to me. But I'm just telling you that uh, that I I didn't notice anything that day. All right. And the judge even says, I've never seen anything like this before. But let's bring in what social media has to say about this witness. Dion says, this guy, firstly, buy him a mega pint. Secondly, buy him a muffin. Thirdly, get him some memes and then a bloody big pay raise. Best laugh I've had all through this trial. What a guy. Fame is knocking at his doors. From today, he is my hero. Good on you, sir. It's a shame he didn't go to a drive through and start ordering a burger and fries. Now, that would have topped it off. All right, coming up, we continue to look at the most talked about moments in the civil trial of Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, including testimony from Heard's former personal assistant who claimed Heard was verbally abusive to her. I specifically remember standing in her office where she leapt up out of her chair, put her face approx approximately four inches from my face. She was spitting in my face and it's telling me how dare I ask for the salary I was asking for. Call now. Mr. Depp, is this the version of the op-ed that you recognize? Yes, ma'am. And what was your reaction when you saw it? Shock, a blinding hurt. It was like somebody hit me in the back of the head with a two by four. And this was the opportunity where I thought something's gotta be done. I couldn't take it anymore. The testimony resumes next week in the Depp Heard defamation trial, and Amber Heard will retake the witness stand for her cross examination. Now, we're also learning that Heard's legal team is expected to call Heard's sister, Whitney, Johnny Depp's fear and loathing in Las Vegas co star and ex girlfriend, Ellen Barkin. Also, Johnny Depp himself. But as we await the trial to continue on Monday, we're taking a look back at some of the major highlights from the trial so far. At number 16 on our list is the testimony of Amber Heard's personal assistant, former personal assistant, Kate James. She testified about the verbal abuse and instability of Heard while she was employed and also described Johnny Depp as a Southern gentleman and nothing but kind. Let's take a listen to some of her testimony. When was the first time that you remember uh, Miss Heard telling you that um, all wasn't right in the relationship between her and Mr. Depp? I don't recall exactly when it started, but it was usually um, her complaining and crying uh, uh, due to, I would say, insecurities within the relationship more than anything else. Uh, she would be very, very insecure a lot of the time. And Did you ever believe that Mr. mistreated her? No. You never believed, Miss Heard, that Mr. Depp had mistreated her? No, never. And there was never any damage to the apartment that I witnessed. There was never any aftermath of anything ever that I ever saw. She felt insecure about her relationship, is that correct? Yes. Can you expand on that? What do you mean by that? He didn't like being away from his physical presence. Did Miss Heard tell you that she felt insecure when Mr. Depp wouldn't be present with her? Yeah. Other than telling you she felt insecure about her relationship with Mr. Depp, what else did Miss Heard say about feeling insecure? She told me she didn't like hanging out in his house with his friends because it, it was boring and they were all old men playing guitars and it wasn't interesting to her. What was your impression of Mr. Depp? He was very peaceful, very calm, almost shy and uh, very quiet. And uh, I remember he was wearing red, red suede shoes because I didn't know where else to look. I looked at his shoes. So like a... <laughs> It's a weird recollection, I know, but I'm just being honest. Did you ever witness Mr. Depp be rude to anyone? He's such a gentleman. He's so, he's like a total Southern gentleman. So, um, yeah. You said you felt that Miss Heard was verbally abusive to you. Can you provide me with any specific examples of this behavior? 
yeah, it was just so random and ongoing. You would never know where, when it was going to come left of centre. Um, I do remember on one occasion when we were moving from part to full time and then the salary negotiations became a real bone of contention. And I specifically remember standing in her office where she leapt up out of her chair, put her face approx approximately four inches from my face. She was spitting in my face and it's telling me how dare I ask for the salary I was asking for, which was in fact approximately half of my regular annual salary. I was offering her that as a favor. And she felt, she felt that gave her the right to spit in my face. Still with me, family law attorney Jenny Brown. Jenny, honestly, you know, okay, she testifies as to verbal abuse by Amber Heard, but verbal abuse, is that really the point of a defamation lawsuit or does it need to be instead evidence of physical abuse? I think what's important here is a pattern of behavior. And one of the main ways that we show false allegations is a pattern of behavior, bringing people who you have been in a relationship with in the past or employers. And in this case, it's sort of the reverse. It's showing Amber Heard's pattern of behavior as being the aggressor, as being a, a dominant personality, right? And th what that's exactly what Johnny Depp's team is trying to show is that he was not the one that was violent in this relationship it was her. And if you were to look into your crystal ball, do you expect that Amber Heard's going to present any witnesses that say Johnny Depp was verbally abusive? Johnny Depp hit Amber Heard. Well, I certainly expect her sister. And, you know, that's a very biased witness. It's somebody who is probably going to testify to exactly what they've discussed over the last five years that they were going to say. If an independent person comes, then that's going to be some stronger testimony. Well, we want to talk about a little bit of the social media reaction. Heard's former personal assistant was very blunt in her video deposition. Court TV viewer Teresa Rassam said on our social page, this seems like a hostile witness. She is very berating, but I like her. How credible did you find that witness, former personal assistant for Amber Heard? You know, I would say somewhat credible. She doesn't seem like she has a extreme relationship to Johnny Depp, where some of the current employees or the bodyguard could be a bias witness for him, right? They're dependent on him for their employment. However, she could be very upset about the way that Amber you know, treated her on that one occasion or an issue related to salary. So she could still be very sour about that and, and want to hurt. Amber Heard, because the reality is people lie under oath all of the time. Right. That is the reality. You and I both know that, and it may be surprising to some, but probably not to us. Let's talk a little bit just about court logistics, because a lot of people have been asking, how can she call Johnny uh, to the stand? Because he's already testified. She already had a, cro a chance to cross-examine him. But we have to remember, this is also a countersuit, meaning that she is suing Johnny Depp for $100 million. So she has the opportunity to call him as a witness strategically do you what do you think they're going to gain by that that they haven't already asked him when he did testify so they're calling him as a witness for their case in chief so it's going to be different questions and possibly something that they are you know are saving for her for her case but you know what's going to be interesting is they're both limited on time and she has even less than him so they're going to have to be very strategic with the witnesses that they have left. They only have 26, 25 hours respectively in the last 20 seconds. Do you really think that's enough time for all of this evidence to be presented, including cross-examinations? I don't. I think they're going to have to pick and choose what's most important. I think that that's what they're working on right now, in addition to really preparing Amber Heard for cross-examination because it's going to be brutal. I agree with you. In terms of, I don't think they have enough time to present everything they've said they're going to present. We'll see what happens. All right. Thank you so much, Ginny Brown, for joining us today. We always appreciate your expert analysis. All of you stay with us because after the break, numbers 15 through 11 in our top 20 countdown, including an awkward moment in the courtroom between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Heard actually bumped into a Court TV camera. Where does it rank on our list? Stay with us, Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Call or visit us online.
Johnny again. Morning, Johnny. Morning, Johnny. Morning, Johnny. Morning, Johnny. Morning, Johnny. Johnny, why should we believe you and not Amber, Johnny? Why should we believe you and not Amber? Oh, not, not this morning, not the time. Johnny, your time. Johnny how's the trial going? How's the trial going, Johnny? Johnny, how do you want to be remembered? Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcott. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. You don't want to miss this because this hour we're continuing to count down the top 20 moments of the Depp defamation trial so far. And this is not to make light of the case. Both Amber Heard and Johnny Depp are alleging terrible violence at the hands of their former spouse. But who will the jury believe? Stay with us as we count numbers 15 to 11 in our list. Number 15, on the second day of Amber Heard's testimony, there was an awkward moment between her and Johnny Depp. Amber was leaving the stand for an afternoon break and appeared to react to Johnny Depp being too close to her. She even backed into one of our own court TV cameras trying to avoid him. Take a look. All right, so we'll come back at 4.02, okay? Thank you, all right, thank you. All right. Let's take another look at Heard's expression during the confrontation. She appears to be scared of Depp, and critics are saying that this is yet another example of her being overdramatic during her testimony and what led up to such a tense moment. Minutes earlier, Heard gave gripping testimony about abusive moments in the relationship. Here is a little of that. What, if any, drinks had you observed Mr. Depp have by this time? Well, I had already seen him drink right in front of me, he took a big swig out of a wine bottle up, upstairs right in front of me as a, um, as in a gesture of, um, like, looked right at me and sw took a big swig out of it as a, you know, like a, a show for, like, you know, did it right in my face to make a point. And then when I came downstairs, he was drinking from the bottle. Um, I don't, I, I don't know what kind of liquor. I remember there was another bottle open and I was wondering why he was drinking both. Um, but at some point, um, uh, he, he had me up against this, the wall next to the cooling fridges and I remember slamming my head up against the thing. He had me by the neck, squeezing my neck and uh, it got really, it got really nasty. It went from like, oh, no one likes you. No one likes me. Everyone warned me about you. That's what it was. He started to tell me that everyone had warned him about me and that he wished he had never married me, wished he had never met me. Um, no, no one liked me. You know, it sounds uh, childish, but... Uh, I, I, I remember feeling really hurt, and then at some point I shove him hard to get him off me, and he shoved me back, and he said, "Do you want to go, little girl?" Th th that um, I couldn't, as I sit here today, tell you if that happened before he choked me up against the wall, but at some point. Um, I am in a in a like a, a struggle with him where I'm holding his shirt lapel, um, and he kind of just flings me, for lack of a better way to describe it, throws me um, across the room. I land on the a games table. It's like a ping pong table, and I don't know if I was holding on to him or if he pursued me separate, but he gets on top of me on the games table and is just whacking me in the face, like repetitive. Um, we struggle on the games table. I don't know. 
I don't know how we get up. I don't know if he pulls me up. I wish I could tell you, but we were in this struggle down in this this game's room by the bar. And um, and we had this conversation about the, the drinking or argument about the drinking. And um, he holds up this bottle to me. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm saying, did, did you drink this whole thing? Something stupid, uh, focusing on this detail. And he um, is telling me that I can't control him anymore. And um, that if I really, you know, if I really wanted to try, take it. And then he's like taunting me to take the bottle from him. Uh, if I really, if I really want him to stop, why don't I, why don't I take it from him? Go on, go on. I kept saying, go on. And kind of gesturing with the, the bottle towards me. And uh, like Dean does that two or three times, I reach for it, he'd revoke it, kind of laugh at me. And he's holding out the bottle. I think like maybe the third time or so I get a hold of it. I pick it up and I slam it down on the ground right in between us. There's a tile floor, a white tile floor. And I smash the bottle on the floor. And that really set him off. <sighs> so stupid. Um, sorry, I, he's... Um, it was like a light bulb switch went off. And join me in welcoming our guest this hour. Joining me in studio, attorney trial consultant, Dina Syed Dahl. Thank you for coming in person. It's great to have you here on set as we talk about the top 20 moments. So let's talk about the fact that really when you see what happened and, and Amber Heard backs into the court TV camera, she really seemed to recoil to me. Do you think, Dina, in your opinion, that it's because she's a victim of domestic violence? I mean, it could very well be. I mean, at, at this point, I think these two people really detest each other. I think you cannot overstate it. So whether or not it's because she's the victim, as she says she is, or they just don't even want to be interacting with each other at all at this point. Yeah, no, you're right. They do detest each other, and how can they not? You know, and it's not tongue-in-cheek, but some people on social media have said, watch, they're going to get through this trial, and then they're going to end up remarried. But I think it's clear that dysfunctional relationship and this jury is not going to come out and say to us this happened but rather we don't think she made it up or we think she made it up right those are the only two choices in this case yes essentially it, the fact is the same for both of their his suit and her counter suit did he abuse her or not and although you're right they're not proving it in terms of any criminal sense it's whether or not her statements were lies and whether or not his lawyer's statement about her was a lie. Only one of them can win this case, but they can both lose. Right, they can both lose. That's a really great way to say it. One can win, but they can both lose. Now we want to talk, though, about moment number 14 when Johnny Depp's friend and witness Gina Duders was thrown out of court because the judge found out she'd been keeping up with the trial online. Ms. Duders, I just had a question for you. Have you been watching the trial this past week? Um, I've seen clips of it online, yes. You've been watching, so you have seen parts of this trial? Yeah. Okay, and witness testimonies? Y yeah, I've seen clips of You've seen it, thanks. Yeah. All right, does anybody have any follow-up questions? Uh, Ms. Ms. Duders, um, have you been watching it doesn't matter. She's been watching clips of witness testimony. All right, you're excused, ma'am. You can have your excuse. Okay. Thank you. I will. I will instruct the jury that I have to strike the testimony of Ms. Duders. There's a rule on witnesses, Mr. Monas. I understood, Your Honor. This is All the right. first word. I I, 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 believe that. I have no doubt in my mind that this is the first you've heard of it. Have a good day, ma'am. Thank you. Number 14, but as a former judge, Dina, I think I might keep this even higher on my list because we all tell the witnesses, the attorneys preparing the witnesses as well as the court tells the witnesses over and over and over again, you cannot 
watch anything about this trial. You cannot listen to anything about this trial. You cannot read anything about this trial. Amber Heard's witness, who knows how good of a witness she might have been, lost opportunity for Amber Heard. What happened? You know, I don't know, because like you said, this is almost 101. I mean, they can't hear it because they don't want them to then use that to shape their testimony. It's a really important rule. And a high profile case like this, I don't know how this kind of slipped through the cracks. And it is too bad for Amber Heard, because I think a lot of this is going to come down to how many witnesses she has to support her story. Right, absolutely. And, you know, I think you can't underscore enough that it's, it's because of the credibility issue, right? She might get up there and tell the truth, but because she's watched other witnesses, we can't say that for sure. It's part of a, it's really a bedrock of our judicial system. Absolutely. I mean, you have a right to confront your witness. And if that witness is shaping their testimony because of something they've seen or heard, then that, that right kind of crumbles a little bit. And that's why it's so important for them to not do that in the middle of trial. And I have to commend the witness for being honest and saying, yep, I did. That's the reason she couldn't testify. All right, you're going to stay with us here in studio. Still ahead on Court TV Live, we continue to look at key moments in the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard civil trial. Up next, we hear key testimony from Depp and Heard's marriage counselor and who she believes started most of the arguments. Then we take a look at Depp's diatribe after realizing her Heard rather is filming him and how Heard's attorney classifies the amount of wine that Depp intends to drink. That's all ahead here on Court TV Live. Paid like no other. Testimony is expected to resume Monday with Amber Heard picking up where she left off on direct examination. But while we wait for court to return on Monday, we want to take a look at some of the highlights in the trial so far. During the first week of testimony, Johnny Depp's team played a video deposition which included testimony from Depp and Amber Heard's marriage counselor. During her testimony, she discussed how Heard would bulldoze over Depp during their meetings, not allowing him to talk. But a key piece of evidence for this jury is that the counselor claims both Depp and Heard suffered from mutual abuse. Let's take a listen. Ms. Heard had a jackhammer style of talking. She was very amped up. He had trouble talking at a similar pace. Their dialogue, he was cut off a lot. So I, I, I'm guessing this is what I was, I'm not sure what I, it is, but there was something, anyhow, this is how he didn't have a voice. He couldn't keep up with her rapid fire um, way of conversation. And so he was really overwhelmed. In, in working with um, Amber and Mr. Depp, did Amber ever report to you any physical violence on behalf of Mr. Depp toward Amber? Yes. What type of physical violence did she report to you? Do you recall seeing photos from Amber Heard? I, I, I have, but I don't remember when I saw them. What do you recall about the photos? Her face was bruised. Do you recall what, where on her face you saw, on Amber's face you saw bruises? I think they were around her eyes, but I couldn't be positive. Did, did you witness abuse by either? I didn't or? witness, I didn't witness. Had you worked with Mr. Depp before working with Amber and Mr. Depp? No. Is it your testimony that while Mr. Depp may have said he wasn't violent with any of his other partners, there was violence between from Mr. Depp toward Amber, correct? Yes, you're right. He had he had had been well controlled, I think, for almost I don't know, 20, 30 years, and uh, both were victims of abuse in their homes. But I thought he had been well controlled for decades, and then with Ms. Ms. Heard, he was triggered and. Um, they engaged in what I saw as mutual abuse. Sometimes I'm not, I know she led on more than one occasion and started it to keep him with her because 
abandonment and having him leave was her worst nightmare. And I think he may have initiated it on occasions too I'm, that I'm less sure on. And how did you come to the understanding that on some occasions Ms. Heard physically abused Mr. Dow? Ms. Heard reported that. He's a very articulate man, and when left alone to speak, he can describe intelligently what's going on. I think I'm kind of, I think while he's talking, and I'm not trying to be obtrusive with my taking notes, I'm listening, I'm talking, but I'm also copying down a word here and there. So my belief is that those are his words. And, and Mr. Depp, I think you testified about this, but I just want to make sure it's clear. Mr. Depp told you Amber gave as good as she got, correct? Correct. Did you ask what Mr. Depp meant by gave as good as she got? Um, I was pretty aware of what he meant. I agreed. What did he, what did you understand Mr. Depp to mean? All right, I have. Um, she initiated fights. She started violence. She uh, rose to the challenge if he started first, which I... And so she, in my opinion, that had been established throughout the relationship that she fought as hard as he did. And he tried to de-escalate far more than I think she did. Still with me in studio, attorney trial consultant Dina sayek -Dahl. All right, Dina, if this jury agrees with the marriage counselor and says it was mutual abuse, how does that translate to the final outcome of this trial? I think if they think it's mutual abuse, then he loses the case because the statement is that she was a victim. Now, if they think it's maybe defensive on his part and you know she's the initiator especially if they bring in a domestic violence expert who can kind of testify how sometimes the victim also defends himself then maybe that mutual term could kind of be changed in a way that's not co-equal if she described as co-equal i think he loses all right and let's talk again about the trial nuts and bolts rebuttal case we know that johnny depp intends to present a rebuttal case at this point in time if they still have time to do that and when you have a rebuttal case can you call witnesses who were not called by either side yet in the case mm -hmm. yes sure and we may very well see people like that that he calls and i'm just thinking domestic violence expert depending on what the witnesses for amber heard said then they may do that social media you know as well as i do worldwide has been blowing up about this case a lot of johnny depp supporters let's look at some of the uh, social media response debbie driscoll in this case for this countdown said if johnny never had these problems in other relationships then we know who the problem is. And by all accounts so far, Dina, he's not been abusive to anyone else. All the testimony presented at this point is they've never had a problem with abuse by Johnny Depp. Is that gonna carry the day, do you think? I think it goes a long way because why would somebody who doesn't do it suddenly do it? It, it makes it more likely that she's not telling the truth. Although that marriage counselor we saw just testified to the fact that you know, she thought he'd never had done it before and still did it. Again, maybe somebody can, kind of an expert can kind of talk about that a little bit more. Maybe why you wouldn't be triggered. Right. Like kind of out of the blue. Right. And, you know, we have all these different eyewitnesses who say whether or not they've seen bruises on Amber. This marriage counselor also testified about that and, in fact, said she can't recall if she ever saw bruises. Let's listen to that. In working with um, Amber and Mr. Depp, did Amber ever report to you any physical violence on behalf of Mr. Depp toward Amber? Yes. Do you recall seeing photos from Amber Heard? I, I, I have, but I don't remember when I saw them. What do you recall about the photos? Her face was bruised. Do you recall what, where on her face you saw, on Amber's face you saw bruises? I think they were around her eyes, but I couldn't be positive. One of the things I, I just said to you as we were watching, I'm like, watch Amber Heard. What do you think of her demeanor during that testimony? Mm -hmm. She definitely seems kind of reactive and bothered about it, which honestly, she seemed like that during a lot of her testimony watching Johnny, Johnny Depp. It's interesting because we saw Johnny Depp kind of face down during a lot of his of watching of Amber Heard. And it could be because I'm not sure if it was 
that great a lot of her reacting when she did it kind of takes away from maybe what the person's saying on the stand the jury is able to take a look at her and she becomes more of the focus point there yeah they're watching both of them you know as well as i do juries don't miss a thing in a courtroom i don't care what the instructions are they are paying attention to everything that is happening in that courtroom and our own grace wong made a really good point as she was watching and said the other reason that amber heard might have recoiled into the court tv camera when she got close to johnny depp was as a result of ptsd because we know that her expert has said she suffers from ptsd all right, you're staying with us still ahead this hour. We're going to play two more top moments. What is number 12 and 13 on our list? And we will read some of what you all are saying online about those list breakers. Pay and save 15%. I could feel his arm moving. I, it looked like he was punching me. Did you notice any marks on her face when you were speaking with her? No. She screamed at me once in person, multiple times screaming at me over the phone. I did not deck you. I was hitting you. I said, you think it's so funny? You think it's funny, bitch? You said, I will her burnt corpse afterwards to make sure she is dead. Did I read that right? You certainly did. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Thank you for joining us. Throughout the Depp Heard trial, there have been some pretty unforgettable moments, and we're going to get back into our top 20 countdown in just a moment. But first, we want to update another big story we've been following here on Court TV. A suspect has been identified in the killings of two women who were found dead in Moab, Utah. That location may sound familiar because it was where Gabby Petito was last seen alive. Dog the Bounty Hunter was involved in this new case and our own Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae is here with more on the story. Julia, catch us up. Did Ashley, this was a story about newlyweds who were found dead at a campsite. Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner. There's a picture of them there. This was something that had been unsolved since August of last year, but last night or yesterday, rather, uh, we heard from the sheriff's office that they have identified a suspect, Adam Pinkowitz, and they had been actually tracking him for some time. They were trying to speak with him, couldn't locate him, and we now know that they were able to find his car, but he had moved out of the Utah area. They also confirmed that he took his own life uh, back in in, uh, in September, rather, a month after this happened, but not before revealing what he had done to another party who then shared that with officials. Uh, last night, our Court TV anchor, Vinnie Paulton, was able to talk to the father of one of the victims who expressed what his reaction was to learning who is now identified as a suspect in this case that previously had been unsolved. Vinny, we did it. Thank you, Vinny, we did it. JJ, uh, the sheriffs, uh, the tips that came into my clue booth, uh, dog coming to help put pressure, uh, I, I can't tell you, Vinny, I'm floored. We did it. We did it, Vinny. Uh, just you can hear the excitement in his voice. He said he knows that uh, his daughter and her wife, they are in heaven. And he knows that this person uh, is someone who now has to deal with hell. It's a really e emotional interview that he gave yesterday, Ashley. What a tragic case. And thank goodness that he does have that at least information and, and a suspect. But tell us, Julia, what, what more do we know about the suspect in this case? Now, it seems that there's not a lot of information that the authorities have. They knew that there may have been some connection between this suspect and the victims through where they worked. And there's a private investigator who was hired by Sean Paul Schulte uh, to help look into his daughter's death. Take a listen to what he had to say about what they've learned about Pinkowitz. Much of the information about Adam Pinkowitz is really unknown to the rest of us. He was only here in Moab for like a few months. So he was transplant transit in the first place. So it wasn't a Moab bite, but he was here long enough to, you know, become familiar with his victims. They worked together. And so uh, he worked with 
Crystal, who was in a lesbian relationship. His boss was in a lesbian relationship. He felt that there was disparate treatment at the workplace because he thought Crystal and Kylan got preferential treatment. That is not rational. That is not, you know, a healthy mind. And you mentioned, actually, the dog, the bounty hunter, had gotten involved in this case this week, and it added to that uh, number, the amount of money that they were offering for tips. And it's believed that some of those tips may have helped lead to this final piece of the puzzle in terms of these unsolved murders. Yeah, thoughts for that family. And thank you so much, Julia Janae, for all of your work on this story. We now want to continue our coverage of highlights from the civil trial of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. On to moment number 12. The tumultuous relationship of Depp and Heard has made its way into the courtroom. But during the cross-examination of the Pirates of the Car Caribbean star, Heard's team showed a video Amber recorded of Johnny Depp seemingly drunk and being extremely agitated. Depp's tirade and his mega pint of wine is our next highlight the jury will consider during their deliberations. What happened? I just woke up and you were so sweet and nice. We were not even fighting this morning. All I did was say sorry. Did something happen to you this morning? I don't think so. Um, no, that's the thing. You want to see crazy? I'll give you this. crazy. Oh, you're crazy. Crazy. Have you drunk this whole thing this morning? Oh, you got this going. You got this going? I just started it. Oh, really? Yes. Really? See that? No. Didn't you were smashing? This is at your house in West Hollywood on Sweetser Avenue, correct? That's correct, sir. And that's you in the video, Mr. Depp, right? That's correct, sir. And you would agree that you were violent in that clip, correct? Um, clearly I was having a bad time. I don't, uh, I don't know what it was uh, with regard to completely at this point, since I don't know the date, but, um, um, being illegally recorded by your, um, chosen other is, uh, well, it's quite fitting with the rest of the photographs and tape recordings she made. So, um, I thought what was most interesting is that she <clears throat> tried to hide it from me and then that she laughed and smiled at the end. I thought that was the most interesting part myself. But so, yes, you didn't I, react. I did assault um, a couple of cabinets, but I did not touch Ms. Hurd. And, As you can see, I think, no. And you may have been, you may have been, may have been drunk in that video, correct? There's a possibility of that, yes, sir. You, you, you poured yourself a, um, a mega pint of red wine, correct? A mega pint? Yeah. I poured myself a large glass of wine. 
Right. I thought it necessary. Still with me, Dina Sayegdal, and I smile every time I watch that, Dina, because he's, you can see kind of what everybody falls in love with for Johnny Depp and his acting and the response that he had, but boy is he well prepared because he said, I did pour myself a cup of, of wine. I mean, I think his attorneys had him well prepared. Absolutely, and his kind of laughing a little bit in that moment was a perfect way of distinguishing it, I thought. They're trying to say how much he's drinking. He's trying to say, you know, sure, I drink, but that doesn't mean I am an abuser. And he doesn't even say it, but just kind of with that chuckle, we all understand that's exactly what he's trying to say. What a great point. And this is, this is a really hard distinction. I know it's a fine line, but if you just saw that video and the work that you've done in your experience, do you feel that it's enough to convince a jury he was violent? No, not there at all. And in fact, the fact that she's recording so much, especially when he is hot tempered, when he is drinking, all the times that she says is exactly when he's triggered enough to hit her and he doesn't hit her, you know, I mean, the jury has to look at that. Why didn't the taping ever record this physical abuse when she knew it was coming? She often recorded him in these bad moments, but it omits the one thing that you would think would be the most important thing to record. And that's what so many are saying. It's like, where are the recordings of him hitting you? Where are the pictures of the bruises? Where are the police reports that you filed? But we haven't heard anything about yet because I don't know that she did file them. All right, let's take a look now at what some of you are saying on our Court TV social pages. Amy says Amber Heard has photos and videos of Johnny Depp vomiting, sleeping and closing a cabinet, but she didn't film herself getting beat up and all the stories she claims, no medical proof, nothing. Man, this woman is making a mockery of millions of people. Hashtag her, Amber Heard's a liar. All right, what's your reaction to that? You know, that's kind of what I was saying. And in some ways, I think that collecting of evidence that she does almost backfires a little bit because if she had never recorded anything or taken pictures of anything, you would say, let's not blame the victim here. Mm -hmm. It's not up to the victim to have to record their events in order to be believable. But when you're going out of your way to do these recordings in order, she says, to show him what he is like, you would think that she would want to show the worst of him. And, and yet that's the one thing we don't see. In some of the domestic violence cases that I heard when I was on the bench, one of the things that I would hear were the victims of domestic violence would never take pictures or even try to record because they were terrified that they would have been killed by the abuser and they had no doubt in their mind and frankly they were probably right. So there are some questions that are hanging in this case as a result of all that. All right, we're going to keep counting down. Next, we're going to hit our last depth trial moment before we get into the top 10 list. Here's a hint. It involves a headline and a comic book. That's up next here on Court TV Live. 3200 now. I felt like the luckiest woman in the world. And now you have red lipstick. Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> I didn't know if the bottle that he had inside me was broken. Amber Heard's testimony on the stand, and what did what do you think about? Liar. She's absolutely a liar. She's she's not she's not real. I don't know. Next week, testimony resumes in the Depp Heard defamation trial, and Amber Heard will retake the witness stand. Plus, it looks like Heard's team is expected to call Amber Heard's sister, Whitney, to the stand, and that they also may recall Johnny Depp to testify. 
It will be a big week once the civil trial resumes this Monday. But right now, we want to continue taking a look at the highlights in the civil trial of Depp versus Amber Heard. We are on to moment number 11 in our top 20. Once the divorce was filed, agreements were proposed between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. But Depp's team is claiming some of those agreements weren't met, including charitable donations that Heard promised to the American Civil Liberties Union. COO and general counsel for the ACLU, Terrence Dougherty, testified by video deposition, explaining payments that were made by Heard and how she has not paid the full pledge. How much has Ms. Heard paid directly to the ACLU? Um, I, that would be $350,000 paid directly. How much has been paid indirectly and credited to Ms. Heard? Um, there was $100,000 um, which was a check from Johnny Depp. There was a $500,000 payment from a donor advised fund at Vanguard. And then there was a $350,000 payment that appears to be from a donor advised fund at Fidelity. Making it total $1.2 million. And when you speak of credit to credited toward Amber Heard to what are you referring? Um, so, and I think I might've done the math wrong. Let me just do the math in my head is 700, 800 plus the five. I think 1.3 is the, is the amount. Um, so um, we received a check from, um, for the, for the, the $100,000 payment, we received a check from Johnny Depp's um, representatives, and it was said to be um, a payment in connection with, um, on behalf of Amber Heard. Um, she confirmed that. The $500,000 payment um, from Vanguard Charitable, um, she confirmed was a payment in connect on, on her behalf and the $350,000 payment um, as well. When you say credited toward uh, her, what does that mean? Well, um, she had, um, w when we initially um, uh, had contact with Amber Heard in 2016, she indicated her desire to pay $3.5 million to the ACLU and that was, and, and these were amounts that were in relation to that, um, her having expressed that that's what she wanted to pay to the ACLU. So it's fair to say that she has not donated $3.5 million as of today to the ACLU, true? That's true. Right. Wouldn't the correct statement to, to the press be uh, that she's short uh, $2.3 million? As I testified earlier, that's not the kind of thing that we would ever say about a donor to the ACLU. Instead, we would, um, especially when it isn't the fact that there was any specific time period by which we were supposed to have received um, you know, any specific amount of money, um, considering that she didn't sign the pledge agreement and therefore, um, it, it, you know, there's an attempt to, so as an organization, we attempt to work with our donors who are having financial difficulties in order to receive, um, you know, the funding from them that they want to give to us. So no, I don't see this. I don't know. We would, in, in that sort of scenario, we would never say she's short anything. Why was Ms. White stressed about Amber Heard? Because this is a stressful thing to have um, these kinds of news reports out there. Um, and in particular about an ACLU ambassador. What kind of news reports are you referring to? What I believe the Reuters article, um, the, from the, the Reuters article. Dina, what a bombshell, really. We learned so much from the ACLU testimony, but the fact that, okay, financial motivation, she couldn't even keep up with what she'd already pledged and pay, she never paid it. 
I made her look so bad. For one, I mean, they're trying to say that she was just trying to extort him out of more divorce money. She was saying it was for charity, and then now we know it didn't really go to the charity. Plus, it maybe goes to credibility. She kind of made a promise. He made it clear it wasn't maybe legally binding, but it was still an understanding. And perhaps character. You know, if you are going to say to a charity you're going to give the money and then you don't follow through, it didn't make her look good. No, it didn't. And I think it makes people feel like they just don't like her. The jury may not like her. I think what is also going to be a really important piece of this trial are jury instructions because we don't yet know what jury instructions they're going to receive about what they should consider and the things, the law that they have to apply to the facts. Jury instructions, are they super important in your opinion or not? Absolutely. I would say jury instructions as well as pretrial motion that decides what evidence comes in are the two probably even more important than maybe even the trial that we watch. So absolutely, how are they going to ask them to look at the phrase domestic abuse? How are they, they going to allow innuendo in there? It's going to be so important how the jury is being asked to look at this at the end. Absolutely. We know in criminal trials, often they hammer those out after the close of all the evidence to, to hammer out the little fine points. We don't know how much they've done of them yet. We're going to have to wait and watch that. I want to bring in again some of our social media because Kristen commented on Court TV's Facebook page. Very revealing testimony from the ACLU. Johnny's team sure knows how to dig in all the right places to expose Amber's scary and true ambitions. Wow. All right. So, Dina, here's the other thing. What do you ex let me let me rephrase rephrase that. What is the most compelling thing you can think of that you need to hear from Amber's team on the stand as evidence for this jury to be compelled to believe Amber? I think she needs a really strong, I mean, she has said that there's either been a witness who has seen him hit her, plus she's talked about it at the time with her therapist or with a friend years before, you know, she filed a TRO. I think it's going to be, that's going to be key is how well do those witnesses back up that she said this to him years ago before he, she may have had a motive to lie. Right, right. It is, um, this trial is fascinating to watch and there really, there are a lot of legal issues underlying all the star power that it includes. Tomorrow, we're going to move into the top 10 moments from the de defamation trial. Who and what will make the cut? But now let's take a look back at numbers 20 through 11. She yelled, she hit, uh, she threw things, she called us names. I definitely support Donnie 110%. There's not a doubt, Mama. I don't hesitate, I don't wait, I just in my head instantly think of Kate Moss and the stairs and I swung at him. That was a first, I'm sorry. I, I, will, I will say, Your Honor, that is the most bizarre episode. Okay, all right, it's just gonna say, I've just never seen that before. You never believed, Miss Heard, that Mr. Depp had mistreated her. No, never. So we'll come back at 402, okay? It doesn't matter, she's been watching clips of witness testimony. All right, you're excused, ma'am, you can hit your excuse. What do you recall about the photos? Her face was bruised. Did something happen to you? I don't think so. So it's fair to say that she has not donated $3.5 million as of today to the ACLU, true? That's right. Dina, what are your last final thoughts about this trial? If the public is any indication, she's losing. So her team should have used this break to re-strategize. Oh, what a great point. We're gonna, I can't wait to see you on Monday morning. I also want to point out, though, of course, this is a tragic story. Domestic violence, rampant drug issues and abuse. Serious issues. This jury has a difficult job of determining what really did happen between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Thank you to Dina Sayegdal for being with us in person today. I also, of course, want to thank all of you at home for joining us.